morning, Dr. Scott. It's a pleasure to have you here with me today. I am excited to hear more about your personal and professional journey and also about your business, all the great works you have been doing. So what inspired you to start your own business? Oh, that's a great question. I think the biggest thing for me was wanting to have an opportunity to kind of set my own path. Um, I was in corporate America for over 12 years. Um, and then before that, I was in clinical, um, doing a lot of clinical work. And I found that most of the time I was kind of just meeting the needs and the standards of the organization in which I worked for. And I really wanted an opportunity to think about what I wanted to do long term and the things that really kind of lit me up more so that it didn't really feel like I was working. And so I decided that, you know, starting my own business would allow me to really get to a point of doing those things that I love doing on a day to day basis. And and if I need to pivot, pivot, but it's all about me being able to kind of set my own destiny and my own purpose yes. and, and so forth. So that's why I started it. So, but before you start your own business, what were you doing before that? Yeah. So I, for, for about 12 years, I was in consulting. Um, so I did some, I did a lot of client work around the, in the areas of psychological, um, any type, anything that was related to psychological safety around just helping people understand how psychology and the intersection of psychology and business works together. I help clients uh, think about um, all kinds of things as it relates to how they want to um, even work with their own employees. Um, so a lot of change management. Um, and then about, I would say like eight years ago, I switched over into leadership development and executive coaching. And so I did a lot around just kind of helping people understand how to be great leaders. And that really transformed my experience as, you know, as an employee, because I didn't realize that that was something that I was going to really enjoy or love doing. Um, but I actually took some time and started to focus my craft a lot more and found out that it's something that I really loved. So. I did that for a while. And when I decided to start my own business, I was just like, oh, well, this is something that you can actually do as part of your business as well. Yes. So there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> so why did you make the switch between the two? Yeah, so I, I started Serenity Psychological Health and Wellbeing, and I call it Serenity Sci for, for short because it's a long, <laughs> it's a long time. <laughs> um, and I started that uh informally in 2020. So it was right when COVID started. And essentially, I was just, you know, kind of helping and giving back um, to our veterans. I was doing veteran disability evaluations oh. on a very part-time basis, just making sure that they were getting the money that they were due and, and making sure that they had the support that they needed. And then after COVID, um, Things started to kind of settle down a little bit, but I ended up getting kind of burned out on what I was doing and was really just going to take a break. I wasn't going to open. I wasn't going to start a business. I was just going to just like take some time off and then make a decision on what I wanted to do. Um, and it turned into, OK, I'm resigning. But now that I actually had that space, that white space that many of us need to kind of just be able to sit and think about like what we're going to do with our lives. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it came to me that I was just like, just use your current LLC and just, you know, let people know that you're available to do work. Um, it started off with just kind of like really diverse stuff. I was like, I do everything. I do clinical. <laughs> <laughs> and then over time it became um, something a little, a, a lot more specific that I can say clients call me for, right? Like, and that's really what you want to be able to do is, is help people understand, like, what are you, what's your expertise? What are you known for? And why would people want to work with you? So that's kind of how I focused um, most of last year, just getting very specific about what I wanted to be doing. And then this year has been, I mean, it's only been like a few months, but it's been a really good head start with all of the preparation that I did for last year. Hey, you prepare yourself for success. <laughs> That's right, exactly. <laughs> so now you said that uh, before that you were doing psychology work mm -hmm. with your clients, and then you switched to leadership. Why did you make the switch from psychology to leadership? Yeah, that's a great question. So when I was in graduate school, I kind of knew early on that I wasn't going to do 
to be a, like a therapist for the rest of my life, I guess. I, I really enjoy helping people for sure. Um, but I did find that because I am, you know, just by personality, I am an empath. I kind of take on the, the emotions and the feelings and the and stuff of others. And when I was in doing a lot of clinical work, I just kind of felt heavy a lot, you know, like it was very heavy to, to take on a lot of that stuff. And I always found myself taking longer in my sessions than I needed to, um, you know, 50 minute point would hit. And I'm just like, we're still talking, you know, and and it was really hard for me to disconnect sometimes. Mm. And with that, it it really started to make me feel like I needed to think about other things, like what other opportunities are there. And it was just by happenstance that one of my old colleagues um, from the hospital that I had worked at asked me if I would be interested in working in um, at Booz Allen Hamilton, which is a consulting firm at the time. And she took my resume and I just tried it. I, I kind of, you know, was just like, let's see what happens. And it actually worked out really, really well. I, I learned a lot during that time and I took all of my learnings and then moved over to Deloitte, which is a much larger consulting firm. But I really found my footing at Deloitte. That's kind of where I felt like I really understood how I was going to blend psychology with business. And I became a unicorn. Like there weren't a lot of us in terms of like clinical psychologists in the business. Usually it was an IO psychologist, an industrial organizational psychologist that was doing it. And so I just made a, a path for myself. And like I said, you know, leadership development was still a way of teaching people and helping people to advance either themselves or others. So it, there is a lot of parallels between psychology and, and leadership development and executive coaching. And it just felt a little less um, heavy sometimes when you were dealing with a specific problem and then you leave, right? And you keep and you do that over and over, and that becomes a little bit easier to to deal with than um, having to be with someone for years and 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 seeing a lot of the developments happen along the way. So that one thing that you um, also you said is for the business you. Um when you first in 2020, you were kind of all over the place. Hey, mm -hmm. whatever you need, I'm here. I'm available. I can help you. But yes. at the end, you decided, okay, I need to pick one thing and I'm going to focus on one thing. So yes. now can you tell us about the services that the company offers? Absolutely. So all last year, I was pretty much developing my IP, my intellectual, uh, intellectual property. So I designed 10 courses um, and they fit all under the umbrella of human-centered leadership development. And that's really around making sure that you put your people first as a leader. And part of that is the employee well-being. So making sure that your people are healthy and, and they can come into a workplace with their entire selves and not just part of themselves. Uh, the second part is diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Making sure that people have a place where they feel accepted and that they are a part of the purpose and the mission that you are actually trying to achieve. And then lastly, um, as an effective leader, what are some of the things, the day-to-day -day things that you could be doing for yourself so that mm. it helps you show up better for others? And that's around psychological safety. That's around emotional intelligence. That's around authentic leadership and purpose, things of that sort. So it's really kind of pouring into yourself so that you can be a better leader for others. So those are the main three areas in the buckets. And I do a lot of facilitation with organizations. I'm a B2B um, company. And I also do um, executive coaching um, whenever, whenever needed. And I try to make sure that there is a, a blend of both at, at all times. I really love doing both. So even that you switch to leadership, you still have the psychology into it regardless. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I think that that's probably the biggest thing for me is being in a space where I can always bring in psychology because we're all humans. And that is the basis of everything, right? We're people first and we're not machines and we have to choose. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> exactly. And you know, well, some people don't know that. <laughs> I think some people are just like, oh, well, I, I am, you know, like I can kind of just treat this person as a resource, like, you know, a full-time, you know, employee or a part-time or FTE, whatever. And you just kind of treat people like they're yes. not. Sometimes, not everybody does it. Not everybody, yes. So now also, you, um, the fact that you focus so much into psychology, do you have your PhD in psychology? 
I have a PsyD, so it's a doctorate of psychology. Yeah. And I, I, I did that on purpose because, you know, with the PhD, you can kind of, you know, it's, I felt like it was less about the person and more about like research and, and things of that sort. And it's not to say that, you know, one is better than the other. It's not. But in, in the clinical aspect of getting your doctorate of psychology, you really are 100% focused on clinical. Um, so you are really, you go really deep into treatments and understanding how um, different treatments impact people and so forth. So I, I really enjoyed getting that degree and, and was happy that I went that route. Um, and again, like the PhD, I do think that there's room and space and time and all of that. They do similar things. It's just that I felt like I was going to get more of the clinical aspects with this IV. I think, I think so too. So now did you, all, did you also get your license? Yes, I am licensed. I'm uh, licensed in Maryland and I'm also licensed vir- to, to treat clients virtually um, in 26 states. So that's, um, that's Ooh. something that came about with COVID. And, and so I decided to do that just so that I would have that. But, you know, right now I haven't even really treated very many, you know, clients. It's really still just doing those veteran disability evaluations on a part-time basis to make sure again, that I, that I am serving, um, our, 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 our ex-service members. Yeah, oh, that is so cool of you. Do you plan on adding that back to your business eventually? I don't know. I find that um, it it makes it clearer for people when I am, you know, staying in one lane. So I think if someone, you know, were to ask me um, and would be interested in doing it, and if I were licensed in their state um, to treat them, then I would have to kind of think about it. But right now, I would say no. I'm not doing. I'm not accepting patients or seeing any um, any clinical patients right now. So also earlier, you mentioned about. Um... You mentioned that you also offer coaching. Can you tell us about the coaching? Is it one-on-one, group coaching? What kind of coaching is it? Yes. So it's it's executive coaching. It's one-to-one. Um, I do some group coaching, but it's through an, um, another organization that I do that. But essentially, um, it's focused on really uncovering blind spots. And it's also focused on you know thinking about self-limiting beliefs that people tend to hold on to that they don't even know that that they have. And so... It probably feels very adjacent to, I guess, life coaching, if you will, or well-being coaching, but it's really focused on executives because they are the ones who are making, you know, the really big decisions. And so I tend to help them think through solutions, but making sure that they are, you know, 100% focused on themselves first, and then they can kind of get to the solution from there. Do you also add a little bit of psychology into that while you add it? (laughs) Always a little bit, but you can't go too you can't go too far over, right? Because the the issue is is that you have to separate psychology from coaching, and and so if if we start to get too much into you know some of the clinical work, then I always refer them out to a psychologist. But yeah, I mean, the, again, it's like if there is some blendedness there, right? It's about executive coaching is really about the person. It's about how they see things, how they view things. And what they believe is the right way to move forward. You really, as, a, an, as an executive coach, you don't give them the answers unless they ask you for your perspective. If they're asking for your perspective, you should definitely give it. Um, but the idea is to kind of help them get to it on their own. So, Yeah, but I don't think everyone understands that. A lot of people <laughs> think that I, I'm going to get a coach. You're going to tell me how to do ABC and I'm going to do ABC. And 99% of the time, they don't even do ABC in the first place, but they think that the coach is supposed to tell them what to do. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, and that's the thing that people really do believe that coaching is a it's more. I think people look at coaching as consulting, really, like they're going to go present a problem and then you're going to solve it. And that's consulting. Like, that's why you would hire a consultant. It's not it's not really coaching. And and some people, that's what they want. And so they have to find a coach that's willing to do that. So now starting a business can be overwhelming. Trust me, I know. <laughs> I've done it a few times. So what were some of the biggest challenges you faced in the early days? I think I'm still facing the same challenges. Um, but <laughs> I would say that the biggest challenges is making sure that I develop the, you know, develop the business. And so it's just like you can't just stop at, oh, I have these clients and I have this work, you have to be thinking, you have to always be future focused and you have to be strategic. Um, and so the, the most important thing that I would say for me is figuring out who I needed to be talking to and where I needed to be to get the exposure that I needed. 
Um, I'm not like a person that's going to do cold calls or, or anything like that. So for me, it's building my network so that I can do warm referrals and get to talk to people in different ways in that way. So I would say that that was number one um, for me. Number two is that as a business owner, a solopreneur, you wear all the hats. You can't just, you know, I don't have a team yet. I always say yet, but right now I don't have a team. So I have to know how to do marketing and I have to know how to do, you know, the business development. I need to know how to do, I need to be the SME. I need to know how to create things. I need, I need to be able to do it all. And that, you know, sometimes I can go out and, and get help with that in different ways. And I have, I, 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 I utilize my resources effectively and other times it's just me. So it takes me a little longer to do things. So it's, I think it's just really around kind of like laying out a plan for the year so that you know what your goals are and then the, so, the small micro steps you need to take to achieve those goals. And, and I think that that issue is uh, when we're first starting our business, it's like something that all of us pretty much we face that. No one can say that I didn't fit unless, unless you're a millionaire or you have enough money. <laughs> So hiring all the teams you need. And regardless of that, you, now you are, you have a bunch of team members to manage. Probably you don't even know how to do that in the first place. So you still end up with the same issue at the end that you need to fix. So, and I, I, I like the idea that you brought up also that it's creating a plan and be able to follow that plan. Yeah, I think if you, it, well, I know if you don't have a plan, then you're kind of all over the place, right? You don't really know what your North Star is. And so how do you know? how to get somewhere if you don't have a destination. And, and so that's so important to like, what is your plan? What are your goals for the year? And then act accordingly. And sometimes if you need to pivot, that's fine. Um, last year I did, I did need to pivot. And that's why, like I said, I needed to drop some of the other stuff, like that nice. clinical stuff. Even though I'm really, really good at it, that's not why people were calling me. And so I needed to be very clear about, okay, that's something that if people call me, we can talk about, but this is why, this is why people are calling. So it's not your primary. We'll put that aside for now. Exactly. It's exactly. And it, it may come back. I don't know. Like I always say, like the universe will definitely keep your purpose around. Like they will, it will hit you over the head. You're going to know what your purpose is. Now, whether or not you're willing to act on it is a totally different conversation, but the universe will hit you over the head with your purpose all the time. Yeah, it's kind of funny. We'll keep coming back to you over and over and over again. It's like, I don't want to do you. Go away. <laughs> For me, it's like public speaking. Like I'm like, um, I'm not, I don't need to be on a stage, right? Like, and then it's just like, but I keep hearing like, oh, you need to be on a stage. You need to be on a stage. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to be on the stage. Um, I just want to like, you know, be with a few people at a time, not hundreds. So <laughs> that's not like me. Uh, here's a microphone. Go talk. Uh, no, thank you. Can I, take a rain, can, I, can I take a rain check on this? I'll be right back in a hundred years. <laughs> yeah. So now with your business, um, so your services, do you provide them to, let's say, medium companies, uh, small businesses? Who's your target? Yeah. So my, my target is anyone that has a business really and has employees. Um, usually I work with... Um, I would say small to, to medium sized companies and sometimes larger companies will bring me in as well. Um, I, so I have had a few cases in which um, they, you know, most I would say this most larger companies already kind of have their own learning and development stuff. Right. Like they already have it in place. And so if they're bringing you in, it's like a one off to do A, B or C and then that's it. But for some of the smaller companies, they don't necessarily always have their entire development plan. Um, laid out for the year, or it's something that's, you know, secondary to what they're doing. So those are type, those are the businesses that I tend to work with the most longer term. Um, but I do find that, um, you know, nonprofits also reach out to me and universities and so forth. So I am pretty much, as long as it is an entity, then I am willing to do the work. And as long as there's, um, you know, employees who are managing others or, uh, working with others, then that that works as well. It's really around making sure, again, that people are just creating better humans. <laughs> <laughs> so now one thing that you said, um, you you promote employee well-being and diversity, equity and inclusion. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, employees are like the heartbeat of an organization. And if they are well, then they have a strong heartbeat. And if they are not well, then they don't. And so many times I would say in the past, what we've done is kind of left 
mental health and well-being at home, right? Like you don't bring that into the workplace. You don't bring your emotions. You don't, you know, it's almost like I said, we were, you know, very uh, disintegrated. So we were not, you know, in a place where we could bring our entire selves to work. But I saw, I've seen, and I've worked for an organization in which well-being was at the forefront, right? Like, and so you can really bring that into your space and and have an opportunity to, to talk about it, but also have an opportunity to learn about it. And I think that well-being is super important so that you can see the high-performing teams that you need to. When people are not not doing well or they're not feeling well, then they can't perform for you. So it's just like a win-win for everybody. So that's employee well-being. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think, has kind of blown up <laughs> since uh, COVID, right? Like it's, yes. it's a buzzword. It's been around forever, but it's become a true buzzword. And, you know, some organizations are really, really serious about it and they're going all in and others are you know, more check the box. I mean, that's the reality, right? And some who were all in have even started to kind of pull back a little bit. So I, I find that when I'm working with companies for diversity, equity, and inclusion, I first need to understand where they are on their journey, right? Like, because I don't want to come in, you know, in a, in a space where they are not quite ready to hear the message that I have. So I try to, most of my uh, DEI stuff is, is tailored to the organization simply because everyone is in a different space. Sometimes it can be a touchy topic. Sometimes people are not ready for the difficult conversations and you have to meet them where they are. So I tend to focus all of, all of that in a more tailored fashion than I do with the employee well-being stuff. So now let's say that it's a, a, an organization um, bring you in, but not for, the, um, not for anything that's, that's to do with that, but for something completely different. But you see that there's an issue within the organization that they might need to actually kind of focus more on the well-being of the employee and also DEI. Do you, is that something would you uh, refer to them? Is that something you wait until they say they want it? Oh, no. I always um, do a, a, what I consider to be a, an initial you know, call, consulting call to get the pulse of the organization. And I ask a lot of questions and, and sometimes it might feel a little invasive, but they're like, I called you for this, um, <laughs> but <laughs> do it because I think it's super important for me to be able to help them understand, you know, you called me for this, but this is actually what you need. And, and I think that that's really just good business. Like you, you can, you can definitely just do what someone asks you to do. And sometimes I just, that's exactly what happens. Someone will say, like, I called you for this. Can you just do this? And we'll talk about the other thing later. But it's always, I think, the most important thing to show that you are truly a thought partner with that organization to offer them additional insights if you see them. So I always do that. Absolutely. So now you said that you offer consultation. Is that how the process started? Absolutely. So I, you know, one of the things that is important for me is that you get what you need. And, and sometimes I think that you find out what that is through consultation. So sometimes I just come into an organization to do a needs assessment and that's it. Like we do a needs assessment. We kind of figure out based on the findings, what the different recommendations and options can be. And then it may be that I don't offer the solutions that they need, right? Like, and I am very well okay with referring an organization to someone else. And that's why I think having a really strong network is important because again, it's not about me, it's about the people. And that's really where my heart is. That's, that's, that's what I strongly believe is that you need to make sure that whatever you're doing is serving others and making sure that it's not about serving yourself and my ego. So I want to make sure as I do consulting that people at the organizations feel like they're getting exactly what they need. And I do that through, like I said, a series of questions, but also sometimes we just come in and do like a needs assessment. Sometimes there is a, um, where I am evaluating a specific program that they might have to tell them how they can make it even better. So there's a lot of just learning and development um, consulting services that I offer that Sometimes people may call me for, hey, can you do this course? And I end up being able to offer them something even bigger than that, depending on what they what, what I find in, in the conversation. Is that is that phone call or that uh, when you go to do the assessment, is that something you do for free? The needs assessment is not free, but the initial phone call is always free. Yeah, the, the initial consultation is always um, important for me because 
I and that and it's free because I, I just kind of feel like you you can't really get to know what you're solving <laughs> unless yes. you have a conversation about it. So it's the time when I'm asking all the questions and and I do believe that you need to make sure you're solving for the right problem. I completely agree with you on that. So now will someone go to your website to reach out to you or um, do they have to fill out something out on your website? How exactly that work? Yeah. You know, funny enough, most people reach out to me on LinkedIn. I seldom, I think I've gotten one person to reach out to me on my website, but there is a way. So you just put um, information to the contact uh, on a contact page and you put in your name and, and so forth and your contact information. And I get those emails directly to my inbox. But most people just DM me in, in LinkedIn to, to start a conversation. And, and that's usually how I end up working with people. But, um, but there are so many different ways. I mean, you can email me directly at kreescott at serenitysciehealth.com. Um, you can call me on my, um, on my direct line, which is uh, 678-439-1395. Or you can just find me on LinkedIn and, and reach out that way. So. So many different ways. <laughs> so many different ways. <laughs> so now, as a woman of color and a successful business owner, what advice uh, do you have for other women who are just starting out in their careers or considering starting their own business? This yeah, is- I would say that, you know, it's been funny for me because I am very conscious of being a black woman in, in this world, but also as a small business owner. And so it is super important that I, you know, project myself in a, in a way that people will want to work with me. So I have found that in this, in the beginning and right now, just to kind of build my brand, I've been collaborating so much with other people who are already doing it well. And, and I don't care what color you are or who you are or whatever. If you're doing a good job, then I want to work with you. And I have found that that has elevated me a lot more. And it's also really helped me learn without having to do it by myself. And so I may not be bringing in, you know, I don't get all of the big bucks from doing that, but it's a really, it's kind of like invaluable because you're getting exposure and you're also having an opportunity to learn from someone who is already doing it. And that is truly like, to me, the best thing that you can do when you're first starting out, um, especially in a world in which sometimes, you know, being a black woman is not always met with, um, you know, happiness and, oh yeah, I want to work with you. So I think that just being able to collaborate with other people until you can get a brand of your own is just truly the most important thing to do. And also the best way to learn. It's like you, you get to learn uh, the way they fail. Uh, a lot of people, when you talk about failures, they want to run away from it. But actually for me, I felt like I'm not saying it's the best thing in the world, but it's the best way that, that I learn. Like yes. when I fail on something, I get to sit down and with myself and like, why did I fail this? And how can I make it better? And when I meet someone like yourself that say, hey, I didn't make it doing this. And I try to ask you a question to understand why did you fail? Yeah. I'm not going to make you feel bad about it, but I try to learn how you feel and, in, and what you, did you learn from it. Perhaps I can learn something back from you as well from it. And also the success. Like, I love listening to women's success. Like, I'm listening to yours right now. It's wonderful because I get to learn something else. But also, I get to learn that we are not alone. There's women out there that are doing great work, that are paving it. But for some reason, no one knows they exist. And I don't know why. (laughs) (laughs) That's what exposure is all about, though. And for me, failure, and and this is not my quote, but this is a quote that I live by. Failure is just success and progress. You you always can learn from failing or not doing something to the standards in which you thought you were going to be able to do it. Right. Like. And so for me, I take failure as something that I am still succeeding because I'm learning and it's going to help me get to my goals because now I know what not to do. And now I know how to pivot and so forth. Like there's so much so much richness and not getting it right the first time. Right. Like so I I don't necessarily see failure as truly a failure. Like I see it as success and progress. So I don't even really ever use that word failure because having it in my vocabulary is, is really to me is not having a growth mindset. And I really do stand strong on having a growth mindset, knowing that I am uh, um, an un, under, um, um, I guess, I'm sorry, overperforming learner. Um, and so I'm always looking for ways to continue to learn and I'm until I die, right? Like you're going to always be learning. 
and learning from anyone. Like I can learn from my 10 year old daughter and I can also learn from, you know, my 100 year old, you know, aunt or grandmother. So it's like you, you just, there's always someone to learn from, even when you don't think that there is. Actually, it's kind of funny you said that. I think I learned so much from my son from the day he was born until today. It's like every day I'm learning something new from him. It's like, He's so much into animals and I get to learn every single thing about animals that I didn't know before. When he starts talking about them, I'm like, like, oh yeah, I got to Google this. I got to read your book to understand what what animal is that because I didn't know they exist. So it's like we are always learning and even business-wise, sometimes I will be thinking, he said, mom, what are you thinking about? I'm like, I'm thinking about how can I make this better? And he's like, what about you just do this and this and that? I'm like, oh yeah, that would work actually. You'll be surprised. (laughs) They said there was um, something funny when uh, my husband and I took our family to an escape room and they said that children do better in escape rooms because they don't have all of the noise that adults have in their heads about why something Mm. won't work. Right. Like they just do it and they try it and it and it works better. And adults are overthinkers like we we tend to just like go so analytical into things and we don't take the the first answer that we get because we convince ourselves that that's not the right answer for some reason i don't know why but there's just it, it's really funny that you said that because it's so true like kids just they don't have all of the obstacles that we do when it comes to thinking about solutions i completely agree with you on that so now what advice um would you give like like someone that's into leadership, that um, that's have a teams and are struggling on how to handle the teams, how to from personal to having a teams. What advice would you give them to, for them to be able to develop better skills and to to be able to make themselves better for not for, just for themselves but also for the team? Yeah, I am really a big believer that it starts with you. So. If you are in a space where you feel safe and that you feel confident and you have, you know, healthy self-esteem, then it'll be much easier for you to to do that um, with others. And so self-awareness is always the first place to start. That's where I start in, in anything that we're talking about in any of the courses that I offer, any executive coaching. You have to be self-aware. A self-aware person is someone who can actually take what they know about themselves and build from there. Yeah. If you're not self-aware, then how could you possibly know where your shorts, you know, where your shortcomings are in terms of being able to kind of deal with situations, what your triggers are, and and then what you can do to make sure that you are mitigating them or you know ending them all together. So self-awareness is number one. And then number two, you have to be really interested and curious about people um, mm-hmm. and and how and how you can not necessarily always meet their needs 100% because that's really hard, but how you can really get them to a place in which they can perform in a way without the, all of the obstacles. How can you remove obstacles for them? So if you can take it from, from that space, I think that those two things together really work nicely to make you the type of leader that people will want to follow. Are you removing obstacles for people in whatever way that looks like? And are you working on yourself? What are you working on yourself? Huh? So what do you enjoy most about your work? And is it uh, the consultant part of it or the coaching part of it? <laughs> I enjoy meeting people and talking to people. I, I have always said, I'm like, I need my own talk show, right? Because <laughs> if I could just do that all day, I would not feel like I'm working. I really, really enjoy talking to people. That is the best part of everything that I do in every single way, even if it's just a consulting call, even if it's executive coaching, even if it's facilitating. I love interacting with people. That is something that's really enjoyable for me. So definitely the interactions. Why do I feel like something else is going to be adding to the business very soon? (laughs) (laughs) I wish. Getting a talk show was hard. Well, I shouldn't say that. I don't know how the universe is going to show me that path, but maybe maybe I will at some point in time. You have to speak your word. Me. Yep. Speak your words wisely. Words are very powerful. So absolutely. You never know. Maybe tomorrow you're going to be calling me. I actually started. <laughs> <laughs> I have to have the universe show me. Maybe, maybe, maybe it'll be, you know, tomorrow. Maybe it'll be 10 years from now. Who knows? But I'm open. I'm, I'm open. You're open for it. 
Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Scott, for sharing your insight experience with, with me today. And it was a pleasure to have you to, uh, to understand what your business do and um, what your business is doing and how you are actually supporting uh, others as well. And it's, it's, it's great that to know you have a passion for talking because <laughs> talking usually is not my specialty. So <laughs> you're doing a great job. So <laughs> I'm trying my best here. I'm trying my best. Keep it calm. Keep it calm. You got it going. (laughs) No, I really appreciate the time and just being able to talk about what I do and what I enjoy doing. So it's been a pleasure and it was really a good time for me to um, engage with you. So thank you. Thank you.